But I wanna ask you, I know third session of the day, she deserves all of your attention, all your laughing, all your clapping, all your amening, all your leaning in. And so we're gonna give honor where honor is due. So would you stand to your feet and give her the biggest welcome because she's the best above all the rest. We're so grateful for you. You're awesome. Love you. Thanks, you guys. And um, you can sit down. Whoa, so uh, I cry ugly. And whatever picture you guys are gonna get, do it now. Because I'll cry and, and I'm last, so my pants are wrinkled. They're stretched out. I've sat in them all day. Um, I, I didn't even dawn on me when I realized I was last. So we've had Julia Veach, unbelievable. We've had Lisa um, Young Hughes, unbelievable. And Alex Seeley, oh my word. And Pastor Mandy, unbelievable. And Pastor Delaney. And then I have to say this, um, I lean behind to your, the ladies that are driving you after you preached this morning, Alex. And um, I said, what time's her flight leave? They said 2.45, I went, crap. I said, she's not leaving now? They went, no, I went, oh, why is she still here? I love you, but I'm like, why is she here? She needs to just get on out and go to the airport. Um, anyway, and then I realized I was speaking after Delaney and I thought, oh, she's gonna do the DC thing, I know it. <laughs> And I'm sitting there trying not to cry. I'm thinking, there's something to be said for a kiddie pool. She's saying, go all the way in. I'm saying, kiddie pool's good. <laughs> Rio Rancho would have been fine. It's a metropolitan area. There's a lot of sinners over there. <laughs> Boulder, Colorado would have been fine. A day's drive would have been fine. Now, where do they go? The other end of the earth. <laughs> DC, and I, said, I was sitting there when you were finishing thinking, you, oh God cry, but you don't realize when you dedicate your 31-year-old son to God that you're really dedicating them to God. I did this to my parents. I moved across the country to them. Why do I think that nobody's going to do it to me? <laughs> and somehow, I, I have said, I love them so much, Brennan and Delaney, and they can go ahead and go, but I'm going to need those three kids to stay. <laughs> we'll bring them for visits. It'll be fine. <laughs> and I know her mother agrees. She's sitting here. Okay, I got that out. I think I won't cry anymore. Now I'll just sniff the whole time. Adventure. So I laid in bed at midnight, um, and Aslan was already asleep kicking me. And I'm thinking, am I adventurous? So I'm ending this. And um, what about adventure for me? I titled this Choose Your Own Adventure. And I'm thinking, am I adventurous? And I tend to think, no. But I have done a few adventurous things in my 59 years, and, and more than is on this list. I've done more than four. But I learned how to scuba dive, and that was really, it sounds like we are world travelers. We're really not. We just went on some good trips for a while. And we were in Grand Cayman, and we, well, actually, this, that, we learned in Hawaii, and I'm freaked out of claustrophobia and closed spaces, and we learned how to scuba dive, and we're going down our first time over 50 feet. I think it was 75 feet. I don't think I'm speaking on lying, but um, we shouldn't have done that. We weren't certified. We should not have been doing that. And we go down and the dive master, my husband said to him, she's gonna need to go with you and not me. He said, I thought she's gonna kill me because he knew I was gonna be grabbing tubes and hoses to save myself. And so I went with the dive master and we held hands, me and a strange man, and it was wonderful. <laughs> And we held hands and we dove. And I did it three times. I don't really wanna do it anymore. I've passed that. And, and I can watch from the boat, Delaney. And suntan, that's really, I'm good at that. Also, um, I've done helicopter rides, which are fun over volcanoes. That was not, that is near as adventurous, but it kind of felt like it. Um, we've been horseback riding in Jamaica on the ocean in the Caribbean. So the commercial we saw, Cindy was there. The commercial we saw were these beautiful young couples on, and we were a lot younger then, on the horse, you know, riding in hair, going in the wind. Like, I'm so jealous of Alex's hair, and I have this fixed old lady hair that I can't, it's nobody's fault but my own. But her hair, your hair would have been flying in the wind. And they're just giddy upping. I'm not an animal person, really. I don't even like horses. I mean, I like to look at them. We were riding in the ocean and we're riding on the beach. And then the guy says, we're gonna get off and maybe have a hot dog. Now we're gonna take the saddles off and we're gonna ride in the ocean. 
in the ocean, I'm okay. So we take our shoes off and we're riding in the ocean. And, all the, and I'm like about sixth or seventh in the line. We're riding and I see stuff floating in the water. I guess it worked kind of like an enema for those horses. They started pooping everywhere and we're riding in the ocean. I'm leaning on the horse, I mean down, with my feet up on the back of the horse, <laughs> screaming. I'm like, I hate this. I hate everything about this. This is not what you advertised for my adventure. And then I couldn't walk for two days. All we did was sit in the hot tub. It was just horrible. And then one time on a cruise again, if somebody wants to send me on one, I am game. I'll go right now. Um, we were in, this is Grand Cayman, and we were gonna swim with the stingrays. Like, again, I don't really like creatures. And so we're on this catamaran, it's beautiful. We get our snorkel stuff on, and we get in the water, and I put my head in the water, and a stingray went right to my face. There were hundreds and thousands of them all around me, and it was deep, you couldn't touch. And I found Galen, I crawled up his body. I'm on his head screaming and begging someone to get me out of this horrific adventure I'm in. And I just went back on the boat. It, I mean, I, it, well, before we got on the boat, we got to a shallower part and they're just coming around me. And I'm going, shoot, go, go, go. And I'm shooing them away like they're a dog. And I just had to get up and go get on the catamaran. And once again, I suntanned. Um, so I have a little adventure in my life, not a whole lot. So when my boys were young, we had this... Um, books that were a series of books called Choose Your Own Adventure. Have you guys ever read one of these? Well, it's kind of cool because the book itself says, before you ever start it, it says, well, if I can get there, this is suspenseful, right? Okay. It says, do not read this book from the first page through to the last page. Instead, start on page one and read it until you come to your first choice. Then turn to the page shown and see what happens. When you get to the end of the story, you don't have to stop. Go back and start again. Every choice leads to a new adventure. And I'm like, wouldn't it be great if life was just like that? When you get to the end of a choice you made that you could go, ah, that wasn't a good one. I think I'm gonna back up and go try the plan B. Um, I think that I would, you know, having power over my storyline, having power to go back would be amazing to change the course of our lives. Uh, this would just be super awesome. And we can, but do you know, and this is what I wanna talk about, I really wonder if we can choose our own adventure. Did you know that there are some decisions you make that you can't get a do-over? You, you, are, you are stuck with the repercussions of your choice. And that's why God gives us time before those choices to prepare for the choices. At key points in our lives, we can make some very good choices or very bad choices. And this would be a great place for my testimony, but I've told it already before. And um, I could write a book about that. Um, we all have a story. If we could only see the immediate consequences of our choices, and remember this, your choice never just affects you. It is not your life. It is not just your choice. It's not just your thing. It is not yours. It, you affect everybody, your family, your friends, your at your job, people around you. It never is just about you. And if you tackle that in that light, it's most helpful. Uh, Proverbs 14, 12 says, you can rationalize it all you want and justify the path of error you have chosen, but you'll find out in the end that you took the road to destruction. So see, there's really only two choices in our life, two plans. There's God's plan and not God's plan. And we're gonna talk about that. You know, it's easy to say, you're all going, that's right, amen. There's God's plan and not God's plan. It's easy to say it, but it's really hard to walk that out. It's hard to say, okay, God, you can have my life. You can have my plan. You can do what you want. It's easier to say that than do it. What happens when a plan gets changed against our wishes? What happens when the timing of the plan doesn't work out and we were sure we were doing God's plan and the right thing? What happens if it doesn't happen when we need it to happen? What happens when our perfect plan is turned upside down? Now, you know, there's nothing like a change in travel plans to show, to reveal how you handle change. And I will just go and tell you how I handle change. Awful. I only handle change well that I initiate myself. Somebody else be telling me something's gonna change, I'm like, I can't, it's more than I can handle. I think you would call that control freak. There's probably an issue there. I've gone to counseling 10 years and she can't even fix me. Okay, 
We had this dream of this summer. You know, we transitioned to a different place here in the church in January. So we said this year, starting in April, we were gonna go to Gulf Shores, Alabama every month and lay on the beach and fix up our house. You know, my parents have a house there and when they passed away, then it's ours and my sister's. And we love that place and it's, you know, on the water. We, we love Gulf Shores. We talk, everybody that preaches for my family, have you all heard an illustration about Gulf Shores, Alabama? The guff, as we call it. Um, so we were going in September. We always, we've gone September seven years. And um, this year, we were gonna go for two weeks, which is longer than we normally go. But Brandon, Delaney's husband, was gonna go with us and just spend some quality time with us and his dad and fish and just be with us. And he had a friend coming. And then the second week, my friend Cindy was coming and my sister was driving over and we were just gonna do, what we do is lay out and eat. And, um, you know, no adventure. <laughs> no adventure, I'm done with that. Anyway, so we were gonna do that and we were so excited. But about three or four days before, well, let me show you this. Let me show you. Can I see a video? This is what we were going to do. This is where we were headed. And I mean, when, when you see this, this is what it looks like. It's the whitest sugar sand you've ever seen. The water's clear. It's beautiful. And that chair, well, I tote my own chair down there, but I would be right about there for weeks. So three or four days before we went, I'm always watching the weather and it looked fine up until then. And then it said there was a tropical depression in the Gulf then a tropical storm. Well, we'll still go because it's going to hit the Louisiana-Mississippi border, so it's not a big deal for us. We're going to be fine. It's a tropical storm. I mean, we'll get a little water under the house. Our house is eight, nine, ten feet above ground, so we thought we'll get a little water. We'll be fine. By the time we got there Monday afternoon, and we're taking our suitcases upstairs, we're panicking. It's me and Galen and Brandon. We're thinking, this is not gonna be okay. And the Weather Channel kept saying, it's moving further east, it's moving further east. Now it's the Alabama-Mississippi border. And the, you know those states are all real close together if you know your geography. It's just a few hundred, couple, maybe 200 miles. It's not that far in between them. And some hurricanes can be 200 miles across. So it changed to a hurricane. So this was the trip. We had this amazing, let me, mind you, pause. I am a great trip planner. I plan every meal, where we're going, what we're doing, all the minutes of the day. I have planned trips for years. I, I, I like to plan everything. I plan, if you saw my planner, I still write in a planner because I love that feeling of checking that baby off. And I have white out, do you know what white out is? I have, I, tell the, I told the person in the office one time, can you give me a couple bottles of white out? And she went, what? I'm like, you know, you white out stuff. She just looked at me like it was foreign. And I had this plan and we, we had every morning and Brandon was the same way, we had this plan. So we get there, we get into our house. We were there one night and this is what happened on my beautifully planned trip. With force and fury. Wow, this hurricane is no joke. Hurricane Sally made the landfall sound. along the coast of Alabama it. just after 6 a.m., bringing some of the Gulf of Mexico with it. No idea where that boat came from. The storm hit the coast as a Category 2 hurricane, packing sustained winds of more than 165 kilometers an hour. Yeah, that's my town. And um, the eye of the hurricane came over our town, so uh, the, we, we didn't die, which is great. Um, we left, we, we, Tuesday morning before it hit Wednesday morning, we went to the grocery store because we thought this was just gonna be a one day thing to pack the fridge and all the stuff. We went to the grocery store and got back and lo and behold, the water was already rising from the water we're on. It, it was you know, already to our knees under our house. They're having to wade out to get our suitcases back to the car, we're in a rental car, so all we could do was just get out of there. Thankfully, um, the Brodies, you know, Dakota and Emily Brody, Dakota's mo mom and dad live 20 miles inland. We didn't know them. I'd met them once. And they're going, you can come stay with us. We're going, oh. So me, here goes me and Galen and, and Brandon to these people's house we don't know to stay oh, the night of the hurricane and lost electricity. Trees were down everywhere. They didn't have electricity in our town for seven days. We stayed in five places in six days trying to find a place with hot water, electricity. We had to clean up under our house. There was, you know, so much water and, and roof damage and it was insane. So we came home early. We came home in eight days instead of 14. And my husband said in the airplane, this was the worst trip ever. This was the worst trip ever. And I'm telling you, a change of plans when you have something so planned out is so disappointing. I grieved over that trip. 
So my friends didn't come, we had nothing. I never even saw the beach in my town. We couldn't even drive over, we couldn't even get to it to look at it, I never saw the beach. And I was so sad, I just felt like my heart, my mind, my soul needed that time. And I kept saying, God, why, why, why did this happen? So, you know, I, when our best laid plans don't happen, Proverbs 16, one says, go ahead and make all the plans you want, but it's the Lord who will ultimately direct your steps. And that's what I have to choose in my whole life. So how to, real quick, um, and how do we choose those plans? How do we know what's God's plan? And how would we learn His plan for our life? So um, one way is you need to walk with God. How do we know His plan? We walk with God. You can't start knowing His plan unless you have accepted Him. Do you have Jesus in your life? Have you asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior? And you do that first and then you start a walk with Him. You start the walk. You take time in prayer. You spend time in His Word. You take every opportunity to be in this house or the, wherever the city you're from, to be in the church, to serve, to be in small groups. That's how you learn to walk with God. It's not a one-time event. It's, a, it's, it's something that happens over a lifetime. So we have that's what we need to do. And then we surrender, number two, surrender our will to Him. You know, the sum of all your small decisions will ultimately be the biggest decision you'll ever make. The sum of all your small decisions, it's the small things. It's not necessarily the large thing. What am, you know, where am I gonna go? Where am I gonna move? It's the sum of all the small decisions. The small choices probably tell us more about who we are than the big decisions. It's the little things. And I've said that to my boys since they were little, I don't now. But when they were small, you know, it matters that you do the, thing, the small thing. You think, oh, I don't really have to make good grades. To me, good grades is a small thing, but it says something about your character and your work ethic and who you are and you try your very best. So I think small things matter. When you're an employee and you're at your job, it's the small things, it's showing up on time. There's just small choices you make if you want your big picture to happen for you. So. Number, you know, I mentioned number two, we surrender our will to Him. That sounds so easy. So I find with me, what I really like to do is say, okay, God, here's a great plan. Here's an awesome plan for you. Would you just go ahead and sign here? (laughs) Sign off on my plan, because I've got a good one. And I, you know, I've told you guys before, I could develop a good plan for you. I've got a great plan and I want God to sign off on it. But that's not exactly how it works, correct? That's not exactly how God works. And before He's gonna reveal His ultimate plan to you, He wants to know that He can trust you. He wants to know that you're gonna do what He desires you to do. That's when He's gonna trust you with His plan. Um, When the kids are over at the house and and the older kids usually, Dustin and Mandy's four, when they go travel to speak or they go out of town, we usually do, you know, we do childcare. They're not children, two of them, but we, they stay with us, let's say that. And we can never agree on where to eat because there's too many choices. Um, we can never agree on where to eat. We, we want people to just do what we want them to do, the kids, like, let's just, we wanna go get steak, everybody let's get steak. They don't wanna do that. So ultimately, we'll just go ahead and write down our choice. Everybody gets a, a vote on a piece of paper and then we put them in a jar or a container and then we're gonna draw. And whatever we draw, we've all decided for sure whatever we draw, that's gonna be the restaurant we go to. Except when we draw Panda Express first, and I'm going, <laughs> or, you know, Taco Bell, I'm going, ugh. And, and I'm saying, well, no, 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 we don't really mean, let's keep drawing. Because what we meant to say is it's the fourth one we draw is gonna be the one we get. So if mine hasn't been drawn, I know by the time we get to four or five or six, it'll be mine or Galen's. So we'll have something good to eat. But what we, so I, we never meant to live by that rule, to surrender our will to those children. We were just trying to look fair. We didn't mean it. And God wants us to surrender our will to Him. He wants to know that when we pull out His will, that we're gonna say, okay, what you said, Delaine, we're gonna say, okay, and that means everybody in your life has to too. So, you know, what if it's different than what I pictured? I could stay here all day and tell you things that have happened in my life that looked nothing like what I would have pictured it. The fact that I'm standing here looked nothing like how I would have pictured it. I was gonna be a respiratory therapist when I graduated from high school until I took one class that was in the sciences. And I went, I think I'll teach kindergarten. <laughs> and I can count that high. And I, so many things have changed. And I thought my life, there was all the things I'd done bad would totally take away any authority or ability I would have to stand here and do something like this. So it's important to know that surrendering our will to God could look different than what we picture. It may be packaged in a different, it, Maybe you thought it was coming in a box and a bow and it's coming in a gift bag. Maybe you thought it was in a small box, but it's in a big box. You know, like at Christmas when you see the small box and you think, that's gonna be a cheap present. So how's my Louis Vuitton gonna fit in there? 
so, but the small presents are always best, and sometimes the best gifts are never what you thought they were gonna be, so that's, that. that's how that is. Number three, obey what you already know is God's will. So, the Bible, 98% of what you're praying about for God's will is already in His Word. He's got, it, it's there for you. It's black, there's a lot of black and white in His Word. So if you're praying about things that are already in God's Word, that you could save that hot air and pray about something else because He's already said, I could go on all day on that, but He says, let's get these right first. Love our neighbors, bridle our tongue, act justly, love mercy, walk humbly, don't murder, don't cheat, don't lie, don't gossip, don't boast, don't fornicate, don't commit adultery. Obedience is the most important first step. So if you're gonna pray for God's will, go to His Word first and see what the Word says. There are directions already there for you. Then there's the unknowns, and that's what we're praying about. That's what we're asking God for is what, what about the unknowns? Obedience is important. Um, number four. And Delaney, you know, mentioned this, everything, you know, I, every time you kept going with another point, I'm going, you can stop now. You're gonna say what I'm about to say. Stop talking. Um, seek godly input. God, you need godly advisors in your life. Godly advisors. You've heard it said that you're basically the sum of the five people you're around the most. And, um, you know, I really agree with that. However, when you're looking for godly influencers in your life, you may need to, you know, look around you and take it a step up. Um, Dustin spoke in staff meeting, he taught this last week, and he said this. He said, who is in your life that if they said no to you, you shouldn't do that, that's a no, you would stop dead in your tracks. Who is in your life that if they said, no, that's not, I, I just, that is not good, you would say, okay. I don't think very many of us have that person that we would say, you know, I would probably try to argue and I'm great at that and, and get you to see it my way. But I do have three people in my life that if they said no to me and I might have to sit on it for a few days, I might be sad, I might argue and I might not call them back for a little while because that's not the answer I wanted. Because, you know, we call the person first that's gonna pat us on the back and say we're right. But if you've got people in your life that'll say, that's not good don't do it, then, you're, then you've got the godly counsel around you. So that would be something to take home today. Who's in my life that if they said no, I know they're hearing from God. And even if, even if I question if they were hearing from God, their advice alone would cause me to stop and pause a minute and really listen for God's voice. Who is that person? Proverbs eleven four says, where there is no wise, intelligent guidance, <clears throat> the people fall and they go off course like a ship without a helm. But in the abundance of wise and godly counselors, there is victory. I want victory. I don't want to have to try to go to the end of the chapter and see if I could go back and start the chapter over. Don't you want victory? The first time we all fail and we all don't do things right every time and that's where God's grace and mercy abounds and we're so thankful for it. But we could... We could um, not experience so many issues we experience in life if we would just get it right the first time. You don't have to flounder around. You don't have to make tons of mistakes in your life to get God's will right. You can get it right the first time. And I have people in my life that got it right the first time. I was the dumb one, but they got it right the first time. Um, number five, pay attention to how God has wired you. These are ways to know God's will. Pay attention to how God has wired you. God has created you for a specific role in this world. He's created you to do one thing that someone, nobody else can do. You have a specific role. And that seems so out there sometimes. Like, God, I don't, I don't see much more than what I'm doing now. He did that. His plan for you has always um, been to bestowed on you to be something pulling out who you are. He wants to pull out that gift in you, correct? And you may not believe me, but I'm telling you the truth. You, can, you, you may not believe it, but God has a specific plan and He's wired you toward that plan. You are wired that way. You can see it in your children. You see gifts and talents. Maybe they don't see it yet, but you see it for them. And that's how God is with us. We may not see it yet, but He sees it for me. And you know, 1993, there's a lot of you in here that weren't born then, um, but I was. And in 1993, Galen became the pastor of this church. So we were youth pastors first. Most of you know the story. For 12 years, and he became the pastor. And within three months, our worship pastor moved to another city. And my husband, um, he really did try to find someone. People sent their VHS tapes to us so we could watch them lead worship. <laughs> They, um, there was not the internet like you know it, and they would send their resumes and you know their references. 
He would call people and he couldn't get a, just a clear release on who to hire. So, and this was like in, in two weeks before the other gentleman left, he had to find someone. Well, um, at that point in, in this part of the world, women weren't leading worship. And I don't even know how he got the guts to ask me to do it. Cause I mean, it, it was just crazy. But he said to me, could you just fill in for a few weeks, maybe a month? And I said, all I've ever done is sang the special before the sermon with my little cassette tape. I've sang specials. Y'all go to church where they used to sing a special before the sermon, some of you? That's what I did. That was can't, perfect, sang one song, the pastor introduced you, you walked down, that was it. He said, worship, I'm thinking, that means I have to go do like five songs, I have to talk between the songs. How do you change keys without looking dumb, trying to change keys? And um, I said, okay, I'll do it for three weeks. And we had a piano and an organ, and that was it. And I went to the piano player with my list. I had five songs and they were all in the key of F because I figured if they were all in the same key, I wouldn't have to do anything between songs. I could just keep it going and have my hand up and just get to the next song. What a mighty God we serve. That was, that was, that was my music. And just bow before him and just bounce a little, but I didn't even have, I didn't really bounce then. I was scared to death. I was sick and I'll let you fill in the blanks before every service. And the lady, I handed her the list and she said, we don't do that song in F. I said, well, we do now. <laughs> and we are now in F for all the songs. And I did that G, this are good for me. A was a little hard, but I mean, you know, we would just get those songs and girls don't lead in the same keys boys do. So I'd be listening to my tracks, trying to find songs. And it was just so scary. So what that did, I didn't realize that that was a bend I had. God knew in me that I had something there and that not only was I gonna do that for a few weeks, I was gonna do it for almost 20 years. And what we started at that church, I was thinking, you know, even this morning, what we started there, what you see, and it sounds like I'm bragging, I'm just still like in awe of God. What you see on the stage today with worship, it, it started with a lot of heartbreak and hurt and people talking ugly about me and everything else to break that so that we could live in freedom in our worship for the next years and years and years. And I didn't know, I didn't know how to lead a band. I just listened to the music. Darlene Check started in Hillsong about that time. I listened to the music and I would just, I, I had an ear, a good ear for it. And I would help them get there. We had a full band within just a couple months and our worship evolved over the years. And I don't sit there and take it lightly every week. I know the price that was paid to, to change things that have happened here over the years. So let me tell you, you have a bend. You have a God calling. You may not have a clue what it is, but you have a God calling. And if you'll just be a little receptive, be a little willing to step out, and, and times I would walk off in tears and think that is so embarrassing. And our church was small and there might be 10 people in a service in one of those, I'm like, oh God. and they just stared at me. Um, you have a call, you have a gift, you have a bend. And, and if, while you're helping develop it and in your children, develop it in yourself. Number, um, hang on. Number six, listen to God's spirit. So um, Landra was talking yesterday about still, being still and quiet. And I, this was one of my points, so I didn't want to share this yesterday. I needed to save this point. But one thing I started doing in a really difficult time in my life was journaling. And I take a journal with me when I'm gonna do quiet time or go, and I'm weird. I, I pray and listen to God real good in restaurants. I know that sounds weird, but I can put in my, my earbuds. Is that what you call them now? Okay. Back then they were on a wire. Um, and I would take my journal because people moving keeps me, move, uh, the quiet, uh, it's hard. But I would take the journal. And here's some things I learned to write at the top of my journal. I would write things like, um, what's the next step in our finances? What's the next step in our marriage? What's the next step with my children? What's the next step in ministry? What's the next step in you know, education? You could write those kinds of things down. If you're listening to God and you wanna listen to His Spirit and not miss what He's saying because you, you leave there and say, no, what did He say? Because as soon as God speaks to you, you can count on it that the enemy is gonna come in and go, well, that, that's dumb. You're never gonna do that. That's just, that's gonna be embarrassing. You'll never do that. Why do you think you could go back to school? Why would you think your family is gonna all serve God? Why would you pay, pay, pray those bold prayers when you know that that's too much faith? And you said that, you know, last night, Alex, that your, your faith now dreams crazy things. And I had to watch it because over the last couple years of my life, I quit letting myself dream. I thought, well, this season's coming to an end, so I guess it's the end. And I don't wanna die. So I needed to start writing another chapter and seeing another season. And if you don't let those thoughts come alive in you and on paper, 
You'll never pursue it. You'll never try it. So sitting still with God and listening is getting a pen or a pencil and being ready to write it down, being ready to write what you hear. And um, I think it was Alex, one of the speakers said, you know, truly, if you hear things that build up your faith and help you to step out and do new things and they're things that edify and glorify God, that's God. And anything different than that is always the enemy. And you don't have to second guess that. I think that's so important. You sense his spirit through thoughts and words. I have never heard an audible voice and there are people that say they have. And we know God has spoken in the Bible audibly. I have never heard that audible voice, but I've heard and sensed God's spirit so strong that I knew when I wrote it down that that was a God word I just wrote for myself or wrote for my children. I wrote for my grandchildren and I, re I refuse to see anything different for them than what God has given me in a promise on those papers. Amen. Number seven, listen to your heart. And I don't mean your emotions. Your emotions can and a lot of times lie to you, me. Listen to your heart, which is your soul, your soul. Psalm 37, four through five says, make God the utmost delight and pleasure of your life and he will provide for you what you desire most. Give God the right to direct your life and as you trust him along the way, you'll find he pulled it off perfectly. Make God the utmost, utmost delight of your heart. If you listen to your heart and you've made God the utmost delight in your heart, when you walk with him at that level, that he begins to cultivate your desires to be his desire. He cultivates your heart to be what he's calling to you. And you don't think things differently than he did. You think the things of God and the plan he has for your life. That's how he cultivates your heart. And then you can start to trust your heart and soul. When we walk with him, he does shape the desires of our heart. And I could give you so many examples and I'm running out of time, but about how God's done that for my husband and I in just almost 40 years of ministry and 40 years of marriage in January. Can I tell you, there's been a few seasons and a few times that I can tell you when we listen to our heart and we ask God what's his desire for our life, what's his desire for our marriage, what's his desire for our home, then we begin to fulfill those things because he changes our desire. And then the last thing, to take a look at your circumstances. Now this is a hard one because um, God can clearly demonstrate his plan for us in our lives by timing, but sometimes he also shows us what's not his plan by timing. We see his plan by timing. He shows us what's not his plan. He also, it's probably, um, you know, if, if you keep going for the same job and it's closed every time you go, you might just pause on that a minute and think that might be God closing the door. However, every open door is also maybe not God's will. Just because a door is open doesn't mean it's the one for you. And if you've done these other seven things, you've, you've started preparing your heart to hear God's will. It's not as confusing, but you have to sometimes look at circumstances around you when you're making a choice what city to go to. You know, obviously they heard from God and not me because I gave them all sorts of choices. And, um, you know, but if we are really applying the other seven things, listening to our heart, we'll be listening to the heart of God because we've walked so closely with Him. And that's easier said than done, but I promise it can be done. Matthew 6, 33 and 34 says, I love this because you might say, how do I pull this all together? You've just quickly said eight things and I can't even think how I can do all those at one time. And what if I do one wrong? What if I get to the end of the chapter and realize it was the wrong one and I wanna go back? Listen to this. So above all, constantly chase after the realm of God's kingdom and the righteousness that proceeds from him. Then all these less important things will be given to you abundantly. Refuse to worry about tomorrow, but deal with each challenge that comes your way. One day at a time, tomorrow will take care of itself. How do we make decisions in this light? The light of, so above all, constantly chase after the realm of God's kingdom and, and the righteousness that proceeds from him. That's the key, constantly chase after the realm of God's kingdom and the righteousness that proceeds from him. How do we make decisions in that light? You can hear a faint whisper when you're pursuing holiness. You can hear God's voice loudly when you're pursuing holiness. You're in a place better to listen to people, the godly people around you when you're pursuing holiness. Holiness is living a life that is set apart, reserved to give glory to God. You live that life and things start to come to life. That realization is freeing. Do you understand what I'm saying? That realization is freeing. When I pursue holiness, when my number one pursuit is God, I can accept the other things that are gonna happen in my life. And I have to check my heart on that a lot here lately. Am I really saying, God, I'm pursuing you? And 
I want my children to pursue you. So if I'm willing to do that, then all the things will be added to me. I've had great friends come to me lately and said, when they were sad for me, because my family's moving. I'll get over it, I'll be fine. But when they say that to me, they say, Kay, you don't know how blessed you are. I would just give anything if my kids were serving God. And I would give them up to move across the country to start a church. I just want my kids to serve God and you're so blessed and I'm feeling so guilty then because you know I don't want them to move. And thank goodness it's not Tunisia. Like my friend's kids just moved to Tunisia to be missionaries. There's not a direct flight there. <laughs> and I will tell you, but we're pursuing God and pursuing holiness, pursuing a dedicated, sold out life to Him, we can, we can get with His plan, right? We can handle the plan if we're pursuing Him first and everything will be handed, added to these and I don't have to take care for tomorrow. I don't have to worry. I don't have to plan for it because God's already got it if we're pursuing holiness. When we begin to realize that what on earth is fleeting and we don't have to fret an indecision, we don't worry, have to worry about our life being a complex puzzle, did anybody put puzzles together during the pandemic? Anybody puzzle at your house? We didn't. We did not. Because um, inevitably, if we try a puzzle and you do a complex puzzle, what happens when you get to the end? Missing piece. That would just frustrate me no end. You know what I love about the puzzle of our life that God formulates and He puts together? There's never a missing piece. And I might not know it until the whole picture's done. But when the whole picture's finished, I see that everything came together like he planned. I will look back and I can now. You know, this is a benefit of having 59 years of life behind you. You can look back and say, oh my gosh, I've seen your hand, I've seen your hand, I've seen your hand. And he reminds me of that to say, okay, I didn't stop doing, I haven't stopped that. I still am in charge and you're gonna be able to see my hand all through your life. You're gonna know that I am formulating and I'm making this adventure for you. I'm pulling it together for you. And if you'll just follow my plan, the adventure is gonna be great. I started um, a scripture Thursday night when we welcomed everyone. And I read from Philippians 1.6 and I'm gonna read it again to you. There has never been the slightest doubt in my mind that the God who started this great work in you or this great adventure in you would keep it and bring it to a flourishing finish on the very day Christ Jesus appears. Well, I have to wipe my nose just a minute. It's gonna look so good on video. <laughs> a close up please. Before every big decision, surrender your life to Christ, pursue Him because He says, He's not gonna start something and not finish it. He will finish it. There's, and there's always a plan. It may be ever changing, but let God do that. It may take a different path than you thought. Let God do that. Lean not to your own understanding. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. In all our ways, we will acknowledge Him and He'll make my path straight. He'll make your path straight. He's got your kids. He's got your children. If you're in here and your children aren't doing what you think they should do, he's got it. I mean, I, I wanna fix it for him. If your kids aren't serving God or maybe they're, they're dating someone you wish they wouldn't date or they married someone. I mean, God, God is in control. And I have to say that to myself all the time. God is in control. God is in control. When I pray for some of you and I know what's happening in your life and I, it sounds so trite sometimes to say God is in control, but truly he will direct your path. And truly he doesn't start something. He doesn't finish. He will finish the work that's in you. He will finish what he started. And you, he wants you to pursue holiness. It doesn't matter all the eight points I said, they're good. But if you will pursue holiness, he's gonna take care of the rest. You've gotta chase after holiness, fight for holiness, be godly, follow him, and he will do what he wants to do in your life. So is it really choose your own adventure? I mean, there's some places, yes. I mean, I understand what I said when I made that title, but honestly, I don't wanna choose my adventure. I wanna choose God's adventure. You know, if I choose Christ, He is the adventure. He is what pulls it all together. I can't put my life together. Nothing like the God of the universe can do. I can't do anything that the God of the universe couldn't do better in my life. Um, I, and it's a reminder for me, a realization to me. I think every one of us that we talked back there that has spoken this week, every single speaker said, the sermon was for me. You guys got to just listen in on something that I wrote for myself. 
And I needed to hear this. This is, I needed to hear it for the last couple of weeks because God needed me to hear it. And I'm glad you got to be here to hear me tell myself about this. I wanna read a poem to you to close. I love this. It's um, anonymous, the, the author of this is anonymous, but I just wanna read it to you. It's not on the screen, so you can just listen. And this is so good. And I will read this over and over um, for a long time because this is super important. The will of God, God's plan for you, His perfect plan for you, the will of God will never take you where the grace of God cannot keep you, where the arms of God cannot support you, where the riches of God cannot supply your needs, where the power of God cannot endow you. The will of God will never take you where the Spirit of God cannot work through you, where the wisdom of God cannot reach you, teach you, where the army of God cannot protect you, and where the hands of God cannot mold you. The will of God will never take you where the love of God cannot enfold you, where the mercies of God cannot... Okay, I typed that wrong. I was really going good. We'll just say unfold you again. Where the peace of God cannot calm your fears, where the authority of God cannot overrule you. The will of God will never take you where the comfort of God cannot dry your tears, where the word of God cannot feed you, where the miracles of God cannot be done for you, and where the omnipresence of God cannot find you. The will of God, the will of God. Would you bow your heads? Um, Father, I, I'm blessed to stand here. I'm blessed by the women of this amazing church and my friends that have come in from other places. God, I, uh, just the amazing two days and what we've learned. I'm, I feel so full and so rich and so challenged. I feel challenged and God, I wanna do better. I wanna be better. I wanna serve you better. I wanna do what you've called me to do. I wanna finish the race I've started, the adventure I've started with you. I wanna finish well. I wanna finish strong. And I wanna make a difference in this kingdom until the last breath I take. God, I just thank you for those in here who may need encouragement in their life and searching for paths to go on, searching for direction, wanting to confirm God's will in their life. God, I just pray that something I've said, something in your word, one of these points would help them in the days to come. God, I pray that as we take our steps in life, that we would pursue holiness, that we, we, we would pursue being set apart for you, chasing after you. We would pr pursue that more than anything. We'd seek you first and then everything else would be added to us. God, we just give you our lives, our homes, our children, our marriages, our finances, our jobs, God, and we ask you, we give you our country, God, our nation, our state, our city. God, we just pray that your will would be done in every one of these areas, that your will would be done in our lives. God, lead us into this next time of prayer that we're about to have in worship. God, that we would just feel like it solidifies everything we've heard this weekend. God, I'm thankful for the leadership of our church and how important a call you place on women and that it's honored here at this place. In Jesus' name, amen.